Hey everybody, welcome back to another On the Couch with My Food Religion. Today I am joined with the awesome Lara Bryden, who is a naturopathic doctor, and we're going to be talking all things women's health and hormones, and particularly diving really deeply into um, birth control and hormonal contraception, because I think it's such a big topic that just isn't spoken about enough. And I don't think that so many young women or older women even are aware of the side effects and all the stuff that goes along with hormonal birth control. So the first thing I would like to ask you though, Lara, before I get you to tell everyone a bit about yourself is what are you digging at the moment? Well, truth be told, I'm pretty interested in menopause these days, <laughs> which is obviously a bit beyond our current topic, but I'm almost 50. So I've been reading about, I'm working on my second book on perimenopause, menopause. I've been reading about the evolution of menopause and why we do it. And it's all very cool. The body has a plan. It's menopause is not an accident, put it that way. That is awesome. You know what? Again, I feel like this is probably something after your next book comes out that we should yeah. talk about again, because I think it is something that is so important. And so many women just think that that period of menopause means that they have to go through all of this myriad of symptoms no. that they struggle and they struggle so much with. Whereas, like you said, this is a natural evolutionary process. There's a reason it happens. Our bodies don't do shit for no reason, do they? Okay. There's a reason this happens. And just like it's not normal to have, you know, terrible PMS or painful periods or all that sort of stuff. It's also not normal to have these menopause symptoms that are unmanageable, is it? Correct. I mean, and fortunately, there are lots of things you can do in terms, including sometimes some of the natural body identical hormone treatment, which I yeah. do describe in my previous book and also I'm talking about in the new book. But, but lots of lifestyle things you can do, lots of diet changes and simple supplements that can help with both menopausal symptoms and period symptoms, of course, which is the topic of today. Yeah, absolutely. So as usual, guys, the materials and contents that we discuss are recommended for general information only. We are going to go through a lot of the questions that you guys submitted at the end. And obviously, Lara is not individually seeing anybody here, so she can't give specific advice, but she's going to do her best to give you some really general advice and some great places to start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Oh. I have the flu. So what I'm into right now is armor force. All of the oh my armor goodness. Oh. You're doing a podcast while you have the flu. We could have rescheduled, but oh. I mean, good on you for. It's all right. Okay. We will power through. We'll power okay. through. I'll try not to. I'll try not to have the black lung and die over here. Oh, um, so, Lara, can you please tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background? Yes. So I actually started out as a biologist, which is why I'm quite interested in the evolutionary biology side of things that comes out in some of my work sometimes. And then I trained as a naturopathic doctor many years ago. I graduated 25, almost 25 years ago in Canada. And about 18 or 19 years ago, I moved to Sydney and worked as a naturopath in Sydney for yeah many years until actually just this year I finished up and I'm now working only in New Zealand. And I'm also the book, the author of um, Pierre de Père Manuel, which awesome. came out about four years ago. This is the second edition. It came out middle of 2018. So yeah, awesome. it's been great. Yeah. So um, obviously you've got that real science sort of side to your brain. Any particular reason that set you on the path of naturopathy versus medical? I think, and what I describe in the introduction in my book, and this is basically what happened, because I was a biologist, I, I realized that you know, biology has a plan, the bodies work in a certain way, and I was really drawn to the fact that the body can heal itself. If you just give the body what it needs, a lot of the time it knows what to do with that. Not saying there are not exceptions, of course, and there's some diseases that are outside of that but for many things functional things especially many things to do with periods there are there are lots of things we can we can do that work with the body's biology rather than against it and I think yeah that was my initial reason for going this route and so you have a particular um interest and passion for women's health you've written a book called the period repair manual yeah did that stem from your own struggles with hormonal imbalances and things like that no, it came from my patients. It came from literally thousands of patients and hearing their stories and seeing what worked for them. And just over the years, 
learning more and more about kind of what works for periods and eventually me needing to put that into a book. My own periods have been fairly uneventful, I guess. I mean, not perfect, of course, like I, I described in the book, I've of course had PMS sometimes and, um, but yeah, fortunately I haven't had to overcome any specific period problems myself. And look, do you have PMS sometimes or are the people around you just assholes sometimes? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I talk I about that. Totally... I talk about that in the book, actually. Women can get emotional. That doesn't mean we're like, you know, I don't know. It doesn't mean we're hormonal just because we have emotions about things. It just True. means you're being a dickhead and I'm being yeah. triggered by you. Exactly. <laughs> so I would love to get into the topic of hormonal birth control, which I know is a massive topic. But I think for so many young women, and I think women in general, particularly even as they kind of get to that mid-age, they've got, you know, they may have had children or they're coming off the pill to have children or they've got PCOS symptoms or PMS symptoms or heavy periods and the answer just seems to be go on the pill. <coughs> Sorry. Poor you. Um, <laughs> I'm worried about you. But, yeah, we'll power through. <coughs> I'll do the, I'll, I should try to do most of the talking so you can just rest your poor throat there. Right. Thank you. So <laughs> the question is, is that the question? Like, why is the, why is the catch all prescription for what, everything to just go on the pill? Absolutely. Okay. And what's the, what's the risks with that? Like, why, why is it just here, take this band aid and forget about the underlying root cause, just band aid this because the problem's still going to be there when you eventually get off the pill one day. And what are the different types of hormonal birth control? Is okay. there any that are better than others? Okay. Well, let's start with this. Almost all types of hormonal birth control, except for the hormonal IUD, we'll leave the hormonal IUD for last because it's a little bit different. But every other type, whether it's the pill or the ring um, or the injection of the implant to some extent, but, um, let's start with the pill and the ring because they're very similar in that they shut down the menstrual cycle. They they switch off the main event of the menstrual cycle, which is ovulation, which is ovulation is why we have a monthly cycle. It's all about ovulation. I make that pretty clear in period repair manual, and I've spoken about that many times. And contraceptive drugs switch that off. And then in the case of the pill and the ring, they replace what was your menstrual cycle with a drug-induced bleed. So one of the things to understand is that pill bleeds are not periods. So one of the first things to understand is the pill cannot and never could regulate the menstrual cycle. That was an impossibility. That was a, a weird thing to say from the beginning. I think that when they first said that, you know, we're going to give the pill wink, wink to kind of normalize or regulate the cycle. But those doctors back then didn't mean that. That, you know, that was just a way to really prescribed the pill for preventing pregnancy in a time when it, before it was legal to do that. So the pill cannot regulate periods. It shuts them down. And there's, there's real problem. My biggest problem with that is that particularly in young women, if they start the pill at a young age, say as a teenager, shutting everything down prevents them from the very important process of maturing the menstrual cycle. Like here's an example. It's, we know with, very clear that mo most teenagers or um, young teens will go through a temporary phase of PCOS, which would be high, higher male hormones, irregular periods, maybe having cycles where they don't ovulate. That's a pretty normal part of the maturation process. And if you, and normally if, if the cycle is allowed to mature, girls move past that and they start making more estrogen and progesterone and that suppresses testosterone. We're talking about PCOS now. And they can essentially outgrow PCOS in some situations. But if you shut it all down with contraceptive drugs, then as you say, you're really just masking it. And eventually the day will come when a woman wants to come off the pill for whatever reason, whether it's to have children or really just to take a break from the drugs, and then has difficulty suddenly, not suddenly, but the difficulty has been there all along getting her cycle going. So, and also can sometimes get a rebound of the PCOS symptoms, the male hormone symptoms, particularly skin. So that's an example of where the pill really fails in trying to treat something like PCOS or irregular periods. Um, 
should I keep going? I, I want to give you a chance to ask a question, but I'm also worried that your voice is. <laughs> no, 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 you're, you're good. Keep going. I'll, keep I'll going. Put my hand, I'll put my hand okay, up. Okay, right, you put your hand up when you're ready to ask a question. Okay, so um, the pill induces a, a bleed, basically, whenever you take the sugar pills. That's, it's, it's dosed traditionally. Oh, yep. Go ahead. Yep. So I've heard of a lot of people when they have the pill, and I am absolutely guilty of doing it when I was on the pill, were, of skipping skipping your bleed. Now, is that safe? Is that not it's safe? To totally fine. Bleed? It's totally yeah, fine. Because it's not even real. No, it's not a period. You don't have to have a monthly pill bleed. You can really just, I mean, eventually if you don't have any bleeds, you'll start to get some breakthrough bleeding, which is not nice. So they need to have a bleed. It's, it's the uterine lining shedding and... Yeah. But the timing of it doesn't mean anything. So no, it does not have to be thirty days according to the package. That it it means nothing. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Okay. As um, well. <laughs> yeah, the bleeds on the implant or the injection are different in that there's no induced bleed. Obviously, what's happening in that situation is that um, ovulation is still suppressed. So there's no proper cycle, as in there's no proper like luteal phase, like ovulation, and then the second half of the cycle. Instead, some of them will get semi-regular bleeding. It's really just break, what's called breakthrough bleeding. So it's really just there is some estrogen still happening, so you get a bit of buildup of the lining and then shedding. Yeah. I, I promise I'd leave hormonal the hormonal IUD till last. So it's a bit different in that it does not always suppress ovulation. So you can, if you're having a semi, if you're having a bleed on, with the hormonal IUD, it'll be light because it lightens periods or lightens bleeds. Um, they're potentially still cycles. So that's, that's the, I, I describe that in the book. So there's, there are potentially cases where I think the hormonal IUD is required to, you know, help with endometriosis or lighten periods. And it's probably the lesser evil of all of them. But just to be clear, I keep saying the word contraceptive drug, and that's because it's been quite a while since I would ever allow myself to say the word hormone to refer to those drugs, because they're not. So we talk about, you know, progesterone only pills and the progesterone in the IUD. There's no progesterone in any of those methods of hormonal birth control. They're progestin drugs. And that's actually a big deal, because we're, we're seeing now more and more from the research that progestins, a synthetic version of progesterone, has a very different effect on the brain than progesterone. And that's why women on hormonal birth control have been shown to have altered brain structure compared to women on the pill, have an increased risk of anxiety and depression. It's, yeah, a lot of it's, I think, to do with that difference between progestins and our own, yeah, our own hormones. Yeah. And so why... How how did we get to this place that the answer to heavy periods, painful periods, endometriosis, PCOS, pretty much anything that's not a bang on the knocker 28-day cycle with no, you know, um, anything else, how did the answer to that become take this, take this birth control pill? Well, there's no question that those drugs erase symptoms. They erase pesky symptoms. I can totally get why doctors love it, especially when they don't have anything else. This is the problem. Yes. So, so that's it, the problem is that they don't have anything else. They yeah. don't have the time to deal with the root cause of well, this problem. It's, it's that they don't have time. It's also that the research hasn't been done on the menstrual cycle the way it should have been because we've been locked in this paradigm for the last 50 or 60 years. Oh, well, you just shut it all down with these drugs. Period problems, the solution is don't have a period, basically. Have a you know pill bleed instead. It, just to put it in another, ter another ter explanation, um, shutting down ovulation with contraceptive drugs means shutting down hormones. It essentially, you could say it induces kind of a temporary chemically induced menopause state, which is why women on hormonal birth control have vaginal dryness for example, low libido and changes to their vagina and vulva and, and bladder, which are similar to what happens to women after menopause. So that shouldn't be happening to a 22 year old woman, if you know what I mean. Like that's, that is not good for her body. She needs that. Um, she needs her own estrogen, her own progesterone for lots of things, not just for a healthy vulva for one thing, but also for, um, 
brain and mood and muscles and bone health and long-term health of heart and cardiovascular system. Those are all the things that our own hormones are good for. And the endocrinologist, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who helped me with period repair manual, has a great quote that I often say, often share with people, which is that women benefit from 35 to 40 years of natural ovulatory cycles. Ovulatory means ovulation has occurred, not just for fertility, but to help to prevent osteoporosis, heart disease, dementia, and breast cancer. And she's by breast cancer, she's talking about the benefits of our progesterone that we make after ovulation having arguably a breast cancer prevention effect on the body. Because I think so often people just think about fertility and having a healthy cycle as I only need that if I'm if I want to have a baby. But really having a healthy cycle is all about the health of your body. Like if your periods are all fucked up, there's way more going on with your body than not just being able to have a baby. Have you heard me the quotes? Have you heard me say, I've said it a few times that um, to say to women, you don't need your hormones until you're ready to make a baby would be like saying to men, you don't need your testosterone until you're ready to make a baby. And I don't think that would go down very well with men. That would never be said to them. I mean, obviously they benefit from their testosterone in terms of mood and muscles and all of those things. So do we, we benefit from our own hormones. It's no yeah. different. There's a reason they're in our body, isn't there? Yeah. Well, so yeah. could you please talk a little bit about some of the side effects of, um, yeah. Contraceptive Birth drugs. Control. Yeah. Mood. I'd say depression is the, the biggest one. Not to say that every woman who takes contraceptive drugs will develop depression, no. But um, the risk is, I think, at least three times higher, especially in the, the teenage age group. And it, it's always missed. So a common story I'll hear is, okay, you, you, you know, go on the pill or get the hormonal IUD or something at 15, 16, and then a year, nine months later, suddenly needing an antidepressant or having to, you know, miss school because of mood and nobody's connecting the dots, unfortunately. Well, they haven't been until recently. There's been a couple of big studies making that link between all types of hormonal birth control and mood. And I think hopefully doctors in the future might start to make that connection. Because what a shame to put someone on an antidepressant if really they just need to get off the pill. Oh, and isn't it just inappropriate? Like, I think the, the pill is just prescribed so inappropriately these days. Do you think doctors, you know, general practitioners are becoming more aware of the side effects of the pill and are less quick to just, do, just go to your house? Many of them are, yeah. I think in their defence... Their narr the narrative that they were taught and that they operate under is that the pill is fine. You know, that it's, it has a safety record, that it's been tested extensively and it's safe. And that's actually not true. I mean, it, yes, it has been tested to some extent, but um, not in terms of things like mood until quite recently. The other one symptom side effect that young women can experience, which is actually a really concerning, <laughs> troubling one for many of them is hair loss. So here's an example, the, the progestin drug, levingestrol, which is the one in the hormonal IUD, one of the implants, quite a few of the pills, is derived from testosterone, the male hormone testosterone. So it's actually more similar to testosterone than it is to progesterone, which is why it can cause breakouts and hair loss. Now on the topic of breakouts, I'm just gonna keep talking because <laughs> of your voice. Um, on the topic of skin, of course, that's the reason that a number of young women are put on the pill is to help with their skin. And certain of the progestin drugs do definitely help with skin. But I guess the way I would see it is that's just overkill. You know, you don't need to shut down a, woman, a young woman's hormonal system just to help acne. There are lots of other things you can do that I describe in period repair manual. And I also present in a, a blog, one of my blog posts called How to... Um, prevent and treat post pill acne. There's very simple things you can do. I mean, obviously changing your diet, removing cow's dairy and sugar, taking zinc, these are all very similar, simple things. But in my experience with patients, most young women would just, their skin will be fine, you know, after yeah. six months of doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, 
depression and mood disorders are something that you know we're hearing so much more about now in terms of these hormones like birth control um, and contraception yeah. um what about things like nutrient deficiencies like that seems to be a really big thing as well it is you know i know i i guess the reason i don't speak so much about the pill induced nutrient deficiencies i'm trying to draw attention to some of the bigger things the way it's um, induces like a chemical menopause or castration basically robs the body of hormones but yes it can it can cause nutrient deficiencies i think primarily because it affects the microbiome so you've yeah. probably spoken to lots of guests i'm sure you know all about the microbiome the good um, bacteria that live in our gut they're affected by the pill quite yes. strongly actually um, and not in a good way so i think that's part of what's going on. And yes, we can come in and I guess supplement some of those missing, some of those nutrients that have been depleted by the pill, but in my thinking, it doesn't really address the issue, the main issue. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not addressing the underlying cause, is it? I mean, if the underlying cause could just be fixed by taking yourself off the pill. Yeah. So you briefly mentioned hormonal acne and particularly yeah. in, in young women. What would be your top three things for those people to do to really start to move the needle in terms of helping to do that naturally before they go and think about getting on the pill? Zinc, number one. Yeah. Zinc, especially for any young woman who's vegan or vegetarian. I'm just going to yeah. say for the record, all vegans need zinc and probably vitamin A, preformed vitamin A. Yeah. Um, it's, a big, it's becoming more popular unfortunately it, it <laughs> um, is, diet. It's a very very interesting um, yeah which we maybe won't go into if I, <laughs> I, get in, I do get in trouble if I talk about it too much but we'll just yeah so let's say zinc um, yeah. any particular form of zinc or just any zinc would be fine well, and do any supplement at a certain dose or every day the standard dose that I talk about in my book is 30 milligrams so that's a pretty standard, I mean, preferably a, a better quality capsule or a liquid rather than a tablet, just it's more absorbable. Yep. Then the next thing would be, in general, no cow's dairy. There are probably a few exceptions, but I'd say most people, their skin is going to be worse for dairy. But um, that includes yogurt, cheese, ice cream, but usually sheep and goat products are okay and butter is fine. Yeah, but it would be a case of just take it out, hey. Like take it out for 30 days and see what happens and then yeah. see how you do with sheep or goat. Yeah, for skin, 30 days might not be quite enough. But yeah, yeah. and then the, the third thing in terms of diet is sugar yeah. for skin. And by sugar, I am also referring to like date bowls and all the yeah. dessert type natural yeah, yeah. dessert type foods healthy treats yeah that's i've had a few patients where that is where it's going off the rails basically yeah they're doing lots of other things but then i find out they're having these like smoothies and date balls and and yeah that is but um especially if you're already dealing with a post pill skin situation or a skin situation you really need to dial that back until skin is better and then you could probably find a an amount that you can reintroduce that won't flare it up again. So it doesn't mean you can never in your life have dessert type foods again, but it does mean take a clear, careful look at that um, and really read the label. Cause I had a, it, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago who she, her, she was show, she, had, she was showing lots of signs that she was eating sugar. So in, in her case, it was more insulin resistance and weight gain rather than skin. But she, I said, okay, you have to be eating sugar. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not. And she described her diet. And then she mentioned that she's having these cacao drinks. And I'm like, well, is that, what's that? She's like, oh, it's just cacao. It's only cacao. That's the only ingredient. I'm like, no, I don't think so. Because you can't just drink cacao. Like that tastes yeah. super bitter. Like you would, yeah, you can't just, she's like, oh, I, I don't think so. She, just, she gave me the name of it. And I looked it up online and it of course had, you know, 25, 28 grams of sugar her serving in the form of like I was a gavi or something some various coconut sugars and things like that and you know I, I and I said to her that's pro that's that's sugar and she's like well that's a problem because I'm having eight of those a day so <laughs> I'm just pointing out like you can have a situation where you something you think is okay this food is fine and then yeah yeah and it, and it's you know healthy I'm not doing dairy I'm not doing grains yeah. I'm not doing whatever yeah but yeah yeah I think, and that's something that's really difficult for people too, is that they think yeah. that, because it also could just be they're eating 
so much fruit as well, couldn't it? Dried fruit can be a problem for skin. Yeah. I, I draw the line. I'm hesitant about trying, saying anything bad about whole fruit. I yeah. think it depends. If you have a digestive problem or a fructose absorption problem or smell absorption problem, then, yeah, fruit can be a problem. I think for most people, though, it's more dried fruit, fruit juice, that kind of thing. Sweet yeah. juice. Yeah. yeah. Put it this way. If it tastes sweet, it's dessert. So there's a reason. It, like if it's if it tastes sweet, you have to figure out why does it taste sweet. Like if it's something like stevia, okay, that's different. But if uh, usually it's this um, actual natural sugar of some kind. I would love to know your thoughts on stevia. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I guess it's, I think it's fine. But I mean, I'm open to. Uh, do you have other information to? No, I just think it tastes nasty. Oh, that tastes I, uh, nasty, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I think you know, stevia comes from a plant. To be honest, though. Pure stevia should be green. It should not be white um, yeah. because it's the ground leaves of a plant. So if you do get pure stevia, it's like a dirty green. It's processed, plant. yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, is it bleached? What's going on? Like, why is that fluorescent white? But also I just think it tastes fucking awful. Like, I would <laughs> far sooner if I'm going to make a batch yeah. of, you know, paleo muffins or something like that, I would far sooner add a couple of tablespoons of raw honey throughout a whole batch of muffins and just be done with it. Get some of the great nutritional products, you know, um, think, um, and get on with it rather than add. And I know stevia is not an artificial sweetener, but I just think it tastes awful. I'm with you. I guess we'll, just, we'll, we'll talk just briefly a bit more about sugar. I mean, I think, yes, there's definitely a threshold. There's an amount. And it, it like you can, a lot of people can certainly have, as you say, like a couple, a teaspoon of honey spread through yeah. the whole that that's not going to be a problem for anyone yeah i think if you go much beyond like up a, sort of above a certain threshold of fructose though i think it really depends on how um insulin sensitivity and kind of insulin situation with people which we can get into or we can just yeah you know. and i mean it depends as well like if you're in the middle of a health crisis and you're trying to get to the bottom of you know an autoimmune condition or a hormonal disrupt you probably really just need to rein it in and muffins probably not what you need to be eating you probably need to be focusing on you know your veggies and s some you know low sugar fruit and good quality proteins and healthy fats so you know i think it's a case of where are you at with your health yeah with my patients if there's especially the sugar cravings or sugar addiction one of my my first step rather than rather than saying okay quit all sugar because that can be quite hard my first step is to put in place things that nourish the body and stop cravings. And so that would be pretty high dose protein yeah. with, especially in the morning, but with every meal, it's highly satiating combined yeah. with magnesium, that combination, basically the strategy is to convince your body that it's full, basically give it everything it needs to feel, okay, yeah, I feel good. I feel good. I don't need to reach for anything else. And then suddenly the sugar, becomes a lot ne less necessary, especially once you get through those first couple days of withdrawal. Yeah, and I think so many people are used to this standard Australian, standard American diet, which is highly processed carbohydrates at every meal. You wake up in the morning and you have some sort of junky, highly processed carbohydrate cereal for breakfast. No wonder you are starving again two hours later because you're on this massive blood sugar roller coaster. You yeah. hit the bottom of that and your body's going, quick, get me some more sugar. So you go yeah. and get a muffin or some other sort of junky carb. Again, you and I, so I think this is where this whole eat every two hours to keep stimulating your metabolism has come from. It's because we're on this blood sugar roller coaster. Everybody needs to eat every two hours because they're so fucking hangry all the time. They need to try and regulate yeah. this blood sugar. And they've all been terrified of fat. Yeah. No, I agree. So I, I mean, just sharing my own breakfast, I usually have just leftover dinner from the night before, which would include some meat or chicken and a few veggies fried up. And sometimes because I, sometimes a little bit of rice or potato, if there's some leftover, but having that solid protein in the morning and it could be eggs. Yeah. It could be protein powder. If you want to go that direction, that just, it's a make or break situation thing. I just find it. Um, I've had so many patients who've said to me that changing that one thing, Changing yeah. to having, having protein in the morning did everything in terms of their energy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think, and I think often what comes along with that good quality protein seems to be a good dose of healthy fat as well, especially if you're talking about something like eggs as well. You're getting that fat, which yeah. is so 
nourishing and so satiating. Like I think our yeah. bodies have been starved of fat for the last 20 years because we've been scared that fat was going to make us fat and give us heart disease. Yeah. So we've been eating this highly processed chemical shitstorm, no fat garbage. And all our body wants is fat because it tastes delicious and it keeps us full. So yeah. you can go, you know, three, four, five hours between meals without thinking, I need to eat again because I'm going to like kill somebody. For what it's worth, protein is more satiating than fat. So yeah. I, I'm more kind of in the protein camp. I'm not, I'm not anti-fat, definitely. But I think, I think sometimes one of the reasons we think fat is so beneficial is that it, it goes along with protein, like eggs and meat. Yeah. And- goat cheese and things like that but i mean nature's not stupid is it it packages things True. together so yeah. you know I'm, I'm not saying everyone needs to go and like deep fry their eggs in uh, coconut <laughs> oil but you know your eggs come with this great source of protein and some great healthy fats as well so i think it's something that yeah like you said i think protein having some protein particularly first thing in the morning just yeah. makes such a difference to that stabilization of your energy levels and it doesn't have to be first thing. It could be like nine or 10. So uh, yeah, that's just a section I've just written in my latest book is just, there is some value to probably eating breakfast by 10 AM. But I think for many people, you don't need to force something earlier. Like you definitely, if you have to be out the door for work by six thirty or seven, you don't need to eat anything at that time. You could wait and eat a bit later when you're feeling more hungry. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on fasting? Do you think that that has a place in helping to regulate hormones? If we're going to call 16 hour overnight fast fasting, then yes, you know, I think especially, especially if, I guess, um, yeah, um, depends on age and situation with insulin, but let's take the 45 year old woman. That's the topic of my next book who has insulin resistance and maybe not the greatest digestion. Yeah. There's no reason for her to be having breakfast at 7am, especially cereal or something like that. She's better off waiting until yeah, she's ready for food, which might be at 9 or 10. But I think going much beyond 10 a.m. in terms of fasting is a, could be a problem for circadian rhythm because protein also signals our – do you know about your listeners? I guess people would know about circadian rhythm, our body yeah. clock. It's yeah. really important for hormones, for energy, for immune function, for the gut. And we signal circadian rhythm with both light and yeah. dark and the timing of protein. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, and I think as well, fasting and intermittent fasting, you know, we're not talking about a 24 hour, 48 hour, seven day fast. Yeah. We're talking about you know, intermittent fasting, which is just a period of time where you are not eating. So it might mean having dinner at six o'clock at night. And like you said, not having your breakfast until 10 o'clock the next yeah. morning. Yeah. And just having that. I mean, everybody fasts. If you don't get up in the middle of the night to eat, you're fasting and you will probably be doing it for 12 hours because you know, you're not getting yep. up to snack in the middle of the night. So for most yep. people, it's just a case of dragging that out a little bit longer. And that might need to be a gradual thing. Hey, it might just need to be a, let's just firstly make sure that last meal we have is really nutrient dense, lots of good quality protein in there, lots of veggies, lots of fiber, so that we're actually not waking up in the morning ravenous thinking that we're going to kill somebody. Yeah. And it, again, it depends on the person. So the young, I guess the women under 30, who are already maybe tending to under eating and have lost their period to under eating. Yeah. Don't do what we're talking about right now. I think in your case, you need to have, you know, breakfast <laughs> when you get up, you need to have three meals and maybe a snack in there. I worry a little bit when in some of the, a lot of these conversations about diet, where on the, we're talking about one group, maybe the insulin resistant 40 something year old people. And then the 20 something year old young women are following that advice and losing their periods. So that's yeah. something called something called hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'd always just like to plug that or mention that whenever I can because they're yeah they're kind of being left behind by a lot of the advice that's really geared more to men and yeah. to older women. And young women need more food and can lose period even if um, if they don't get enough food. And one thing I'm going to just say here is that for any of your listeners who have lost their period and are not sure why. Just take care that there is um, something happening right now where it's quite common for women with hypothalamic amenorrhea or under eating to be misdiagnosed with PCOS because yeah. doctors are relying on the ultra, pelvic ultrasound and the finding of polycystic ovaries to diagnose PCOS and PCOS cannot be diagnosed that way. PCOS is a real thing that is associated with high levels of male hormones and yeah. irregular periods and sometimes insulin resistance. 
But just having polycystic on ovaries, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound does not mean you have PCOS. And just really take care of my, my last Instagram post. Well, I don't know when this is coming out, but an Instagram post I did around the middle of October um, yeah. was around co um, comparing and contrasting PCOS and, and under eating and kind of what that looks like. So I hope that yeah. will help someone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think we've actually got some questions about hypothalamic, yeah. hypothalamic amenorrhea yeah. anyway. Um, and I think as well, fasting is one of those things, particularly for women, you just need to be really careful about the rest of the stress in your life as well because not eating is a stress, which is why particularly young women, if they're under eating, they will lose their period because your body is like, okay, shut down reproduction because there is some sort of crisis going on here. We are in a stressful situation. So reproducing is the last thing we need to do. Let's shuttle all of our energy to everywhere else. Yeah, it's, it's a bit more than that with young women. It's, it's not just that it's stressful, it's that their hypothalamus or the command center in their brain perceives quite rightly that there is not enough food to make a baby, like literally yeah. not enough food. Yeah. And it shuts down hormones. Now, just to, just to compare and contrast, men's hormonal system doesn't do that. Their hormonal system's never going to go. Oh, there's not enough, you know, food to make sperm. Like they don't have that. They they don't require seventy five thousand extra calories to you know to make sperm, basically. So and to make testosterone, they're in a very different situation. And the and other interesting thing about men versus women is that in general, fasting for men reduces stress hormones. For women, it increases them. So. Yeah really take care next time you're listening to some men talk about what works for health they really mean what works for men yeah yeah absolutely and i mean stress could be that you're having a stressful time in your relationship it could be that you're not getting enough sleep it could be that you are over exercising and whether you perceive that over exercising as being too much if your body is perceiving it to be too much it is too much um and i think a lot of people don't realize that even though exercise is healthy and it's a great thing for us to move our body, sometimes it is just too much for our body at that time. And I remember when I was trying to fall pregnant, um, I came off the pill and it took me probably nine months to actually even get a period back. And then in that time, I had the worst hormonal acne. I'd never had acne in my life, never had it as a teenager. And I had this hormonal acne that was just I seriously would just about cry every day yep. just thinking yep. what the hell is going on I'm a 30 something year old woman and I yep. rarely rarely wear makeup and I felt like I could not leave the house I just cystic horrendous painful yep. it's fucking awful and um and at the time I was doing crossfit and I seriously I had my nutrition so dialed in I could not have had anything more dialed in and I just didn't realize that it was too much. Everything was too much. I needed to stop doing CrossFit. I needed to just go for some gentle walks and meditate and calm down because my body was so stressed, so stressed. It's that. It's also there's just a withdrawal syndrome from some of the contraceptive drugs that causes acne, basically. Yeah. So sometimes what I say to my patients with post pill acne, I talk about it in the book too. It's not a problem with you it's a problem with the drug that you were given and are now trying to withdraw from. It can, like yeah. you say, like it happens in women who never had skin problems before suddenly, yeah, having to go through that process. And it takes about six to 12 months, usually post pill acne, trying to come off Yaz or Diane or what were you on? Diane. Yeah. Diane's the worst. So that's a drug called Cipterone, which suppresses um, to male hormone, well, androgens and skin oils to childhood levels in women which is not good because that's not normal for an adult and so the body upregulates skin oils and androgens and then when in response to the drug and then when you stop the drug they just like they, they're upregulated so they stay upregulated for six to 12 months and usually post pill acne coming off um diane or yes or yasmin is those drugs is peaks it usually peaks at about the six month part mark was that you like at about six months you're thinking i don't even know what to do anymore i'm just going crazy Absolutely. and then it usually starts to improve on its own anyway but you can there's other things you can do to help with that yeah it, it it was terrible and it actually took me over two years to fall pregnant um yeah. had one miscarriage beforehand and um was working with a naturopath at the time and that was due to really low progesterone as well 
which again, I think was just a lot of the stress that I was putting my body under yeah. mental, emotional, but also, you know, the physical stress of thinking that yeah. I needed to do all this exercise and keep my body really strong and healthy. Whereas what I really needed to do was just calm the fuck down. <laughs> yep. No, it's, a, it's not an easy process for sure. It's not, it's not at all. But I think so many people don't realize how, how difficult it can be. And I think for such a long time, you know, we just, we don't want to fall pregnant and we'll do whatever that means to not do that. And then you think that you can just click your fingers when you're ready and then it's all going to happen. And I would say for 90% of the people who I know, that's just not the case. Unfortunately, you can't just come off your pill and pregnant and everything be okay what I find just as a if it helps your listeners what I find with my patients is it depends on the age it was started so yes there are women out there who especially if they started the the pill later like a little bit later into their 20s after they'd had quite a few years of cycling to mature Mm -hmm. the menstrual cycle then if they take the pill for a couple of years, they can usually probably just start, stop, like stop it and get their periods back, get their ovulations back and fall pregnant straight away. That does happen. But the thing is, we hear those stories about those women who can just stop with no problems. And then we think that's going to apply to everyone, but forgetting that this might be a young woman who started the pill at 13, especially yeah. a strong one like Diane, which, yeah, yeah this is going to be a very different story. Absolutely. Post pill amenorrhea or post pill lack of periods or post pill syndrome if you will it's kind of a controversial term but and then interestingly um and also quite frighteningly because by the time I came off the pill I think I was really starting to get my head around the fact that that was just not a great thing to be on anyway um but of course I was seeing a, an obstetrician and his first answer to was oh here we'll just take some climate just yeah, no. take this to force your body to ovulate I'm like no my body's not ready to have a baby like yeah. everything about what's going on here my body's saying can't grow a healthy human, not going to happen. So let's force it to do that. I don't think so. Anyway, needless to say, yeah. I got a new obstetrician. But yeah. Um, but I, but it's interesting, isn't it? Like the answer initially was here, take the pill. And then after that, okay, well, here, take some more drugs to fix what we've fucked up for a really long time and see how you go with that. And how right. does that, that create, you know, this healthy, thriving pregnancy when you're, everything in your body is saying, no, these conditions are not right to grow a human, but we'll just force it. Just force it and see what happens. Yeah, not agree. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's try and start working through some of these questions. So this one is how to switch from managing endometriosis with hormonal contraception to a natural method. Okay. Well, the first question is endometriosis, which is its own yeah. podcast. But yeah. We will, what I'm going to say is endometriosis is different from all other hormonal conditions Yeah. Um, in that it's not, from, sorry, from all other period problems in that it's not a hormonal condition. It's an inflammatory disease that can be relatively mild or can be obviously quite serious yeah. depending on the stage and the type. And so... I would just say, like, it, it, in general, and I, I, did this, I make this clear in my book and most of my work, I'd say for most period problems, including irregular periods, skin, mood, even heavy periods to some extent, you know, I think those are all fairly straightforward to correct, and the pill is not a solution. In the case of endometriosis, it's a little bit more complicated, and some, and I can, I can share this, I mean, with my patients especially if they come to me and they have severe endometriosis and they're on the pill, I don't want them to stop the pill straight away. I don't because potentially if, well, if the, if the contraceptive drugs are managing to suppress the disease to some extent, then you don't want to just immediately stop that. You need to make a plan to treat the inflammatory disease. Yeah. And I have a blog, it's in my book, chapter nine, but it's also, I have a blog post called endometriosis, treat the immune system. Okay. Endometriosis is more in the category of inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and arthritis and things like that. It's that kind of thing. So you really do need to make a plan. Yeah. Do you think it's autoimmune in nature? I think to say that it's autoimmune is unfortunately very controversial and not popular. So I'll yeah. say um, it doesn't even need to be stated as categorically autoimmune because the research isn't quite there yet, but it is 
a disease of immune dysfunction. Yeah. I'll say that. It's not yeah. a disease. Usually the hormones with, uh, like, unless they're on the pill, obviously, but usually most of my endometriosis patients, their hormones are fine. Like they're cycling, they're ovulating, they're making progesterone. There's other stuff going on that um, needs to be addressed. And so treatments would look like, just as an example, this is obviously, as we said, not a treatment specifically for that person who asked the question, but just the yes. kinds of things I talk about in my book is that is endometriosis is the kind of disease where you potentially have to look at being strictly dairy-free, gluten-free, and not just dialing it down like we were talking about with sugar or just finding a sweet spot or, no, it's because it's an inflammatory disease of an immune type. It needs to be treated kind of like you'd more would treat like um, autoimmune thyroid disease or something like that. And then there has to be some degree of gut work because the gut is very involved and not just, oh, the little bit of inflammation from the gut, but usually there's quite a lot of inflammation coming from the gut that may be one of the main driving sources of endometriosis combined with genetics, combined with malfunctioning of the immune system. So that gives you a sampling. I know that makes it sound quite complicated, but um, I would say the starting place might be my blog post that I just referred to. Yes. We'll put that in the show notes. Chapter, chapter nine of peer to peer manual, reaching out to, cause there, I'm not the only one talking about endometriosis in this way. There's lots of other people talking about it this way, looking at, you know, an, um, an immune modulating or anti-inflammatory strategy for the yeah. disease combined with sometimes yes, if required surgery, although endometriosis should never be surgery after surgery after surgery. And before we leave the topic entirely, I will say for what it's worth, there's um, natural progesterone capsules, which are called Prometrium in Australia. Are most of your viewers in Australia or uh, around Australia the Australia and the US. Okay, so it's called Prometrium in both of those countries. It's called Eutrogestin in the UK and New Zealand. It's the brand name. It's a, it's a capsule of progesterone. I'm not a progestin, like in contraceptive drugs. And so Hannah's, in chapter nine of period repair manual, Hannah's patient story is one of my patients who, amongst other things that she did, she switched from the sun, which is one of the drugs that's used to Prometrium and was able to see some good results from that. Awesome. So how to manage heavy periods? My doctor says my only option is birth control. <laughs> Do you know the age of the, the person asking? Or I mean, no. okay. All right, so in, in my writing, I've sort of divided, I mean, anyone at any age can have heavy periods, obviously. I would and say he, she's under 30 from the Yeah, future. okay. Well, look, and the thing about heavy periods, first of all, it's about trying to figure out what's causing them. So if it's endometriosis or something called adenomyosis, then that needs to be treated as per the previous question. If um, some women with heavy periods actually have a, coagulation or like a blood clotting disorder that needs to be, that needs to be screened for actually. In, but in some situations, um, the cause is having anovulatory cycles or cycles where you didn't ovulate or make progesterone because progesterone has a period lightening effect. That's one of its many beneficial effects. So if there are, if you're not ovulating, then the, the plan is to find a way to ovulate, um, which could mean addressing insulin resistance or something like that. But if, if, if there's just really no obvious explanation, then the treatments that I provide in period repair manual and also a blog post called, because most of the stuff that's in my book is also freely available in blog posts. Not all of it. There's obviously a lot more in the book, but the blog post is called um, how to how to treat heavy periods with diet and natural progesterone. So I talk about the natural progesterone capsules there as well. But just in a nutshell, the diet change that works for lightening periods is no dairy. 